Okay, it's 12.02, so we might um, get started. Uh, thank you everyone um, for joining us um, today. Um, so this is um, our fifth or fourth webinar, sorry. Um, we, um, we had three webinars for the, the past three weeks. Um, and if you haven't been able to join us, uh, the recordings for all those webinars are available and our, on our YouTube channel. Um, today we'll, um, we'll get a chemical update from um, Kevin Bodnarek, um, a consultant from Corteva and from Stoller. And next week we have our last webinar, uh, which will be um, held on Wednesday at 12 p.m. again, um, and you'll get an export update. So just um, a little bit of housekeeping. If I could ask everyone to mute their microphone and um, stop their video, that'll be great, thank you. And if you have any questions, please um, feel free to use the chat function or um, you can unmute yourself um, and ask the question. So there'll be time for question at the end of each presentation. If you have any technical difficulties, uh, you can use the chat function um, or you can just um, text me. So this webinar will be recorded as well um, and it'll be available on our YouTube channel next week and we'll share it via our newsletter. Um, at the end of this webinar, I will send uh, a follow-up follow email with a feedback survey and I'll also share the slides from today. So um, with that further ado, um, I'll, we'll hand over to Kevin. So as I said, um, Kevin is uh, a consultant and does um, quite a lot of work with uh, Horde Innovation. And Kevin will um, talk to us today about um, the re regulatory pressures on agrochemicals, uh, both in Australia um, and overseas. Um, so Kevin, if you uh, would like to share your screen. Thanks, Maureen. Um, what I thought I'd do today is just briefly take people through um, at least what I see as being the sort of challenges facing horticultural industries at the moment in terms of um, chemical access. Um, and I'll focus on sort of three areas. The access side of things, retaining, and in relation to retaining access, some of the regulatory pressures, you know, where they're coming from, what the issues are, and I'll give a few examples in that. Touch on things to do with gaining access to new chemistry, uh, some of the difficulties, I suppose, uh, from an Australian perspective anyway, and then also how some of this it impacts on issues to do with trade and more to do in terms of MRLs and those sort of the MRL gaps, if you like, that uh, occur because of those uh, missing uses, if you like, or missing MRLs. In terms of the retaining, the um, regulatory pressures are primarily coming from the fact that Globally, we've got reconsiderations or re-evaluations, reviews, whichever word you want to use, um, depends on what jurisdiction you're in, uh, of chemicals that have been around for a while. Um, the, the levels of reviews that are occurring are significant. Um, we've got them occurring nationally, both here in Australia um, and internationally. As an example, we've got the APVMA, I've got 13 in progress that, that they're in the process of trying to finalise. Um, and there's been a further 19 uh, that they previously nominated uh, for reviews once they clear the decks of the current ones. Uh, of the current ones, we've got things like, um, I think chlorpyrifos is still sort of limping towards the final line, uh, the finish line. Um, methidathione, well, we, that's already on the way out. Uh, so we've got a number of those, and then I'll touch on some of the ones that are, um, that are coming up, I suppose, from an Australian perspective. Internationally, at Codex, there is about 19 compounds scheduled for review over the next few years. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, Codex is the United Nations standard setting body uh, and there's a Codex Committee on Pesticide Residues that sets, um, well, if you like, Codex MRLs. The Codex MRLs are important because a number of countries will reference Codex MRLs or defer to Codex MRLs. They're also important in terms of um, WTO. Uh, the WTO, if there's a dispute over 
standards, the, the WTO will reference, if you like, the Codex MRLs as, as a basis to, as a starting point. Uh, in Canada, we've got the PMRO, the Pesticides Management Regulatory Authority, have got 17 reviews in progress. And Europe, there's a whole rolling system in Europe. They're on about a 15 year cycle. Uh, where they, they roll around looking through those uh, compounds on a regular basis. And then you've got US EPA also doing assessments and this type of thing. So it's, it's, a, it's a global function, it's happening and, um, and it's having impacts on older chemicals in particular. Why is this so, or why is it important? Um, primarily what's occurring is that we're seeing new um, and or refined risk assessment methodologies being developed. Um, so there've been significant changes over the sorts of aspects of, you know, from, from a chemical point of view that are being reviewed now than say were even 10 years ago, 15, 20 years ago. And then we're looking at compounds that have been around since sort of you know, the last 40 years, it maybe was first registered in the 60s. Um, the difficulty there is that uh, the, the compounds basically, the data just doesn't exist. Um, where these things are coming, we're looking at short-term dietary exposure. Uh, historically, people, used to assess dietary exposure in terms of what was called an acceptable daily intake that sort of assessed things on a theoretical estimate of a lifetime exposure. That changed uh, more recently, well not changed, it was sort of added to by short-term dietary exposure where they're looking at exposure in a 24 hour period. Um, there's new areas now coming where they're looking at things to do with antimicrobial resistance and they're looking at the assessment, primarily fungicides and the potential impact on the human gut biome. So you've got all these new areas of risk assessment that are coming up. Now, obviously to do those assessments, they require data. And then, okay, there's the environmental side of things. We're looking at offsite movement. And increasingly now we're looking at pollinators, uh, looking at uh, freshwater um, uh, invertebrates, those types of things, you know, what sort of impacts are occurring other than the more traditional things that looking at birds and, and other animals. And as I mentioned, they all require the provision of data. And that's where um, problems are occurring um, from the group, the issue is that those data gaps will be crit critical. If there's no data, if there's no relevant data, the risk assessment and review outcomes are uncertain because if they can't complete the review, um, then from a, the perspective of the regulators and there's, uh, I suppose, an increasing level of conservatism there in terms of the, the, the perspective that regulators are taking towards these sort of things. If they can't be certain, then more often than not, the answer will be no. Um, and that's what's, I think, increasingly happening with a lot of older compounds. Um, a lot of these older compounds, the, the, there's a lack of data. And so what we're seeing is a particular compound that's been on the market for, say, 40 years, the original registrant, assuming they still exist, um, would be unlikely to have that data uh, because the whole risk assessment methodologies have moved on. The data requirements have changed. They've become a lot more significant. Um, these compounds are generic. Who's going to step up? to actually generate that data. If we're looking at a, a compound where from a, from a company perspective, I would imagine the margins are fairly slim uh, and the costs would be significant uh, to try and generate the data to try and support those, those, um, those older compounds. And so we end up in a situation where as these things come up for review, um, they basically fall over through lack of data. Not necessarily because there is actually a problem, but the issue is that there's no data to show that, show that there isn't a problem. Um, so what I want to do is just quickly go through a couple of examples of, if you like, issues that are that are on the horizon uh, for a number of in industries. Uh, I think mangoes is one, um, and I'll touch on the the dithiocarbonates, those fungicides that are used extensively in horticulture, as well as um, touch on the neonicotinoid uh, insecticides. With respect to the dithiocarbonates, they're in the process of being reviewed in a number of places in Canada. Um, Metaram, I think, is uh, only one use was retained, and that's for use on potatoes. All other uses are gone. Thyram, all food uses were cancelled. Zyram, all uses were cancelled. Mancozeb is still in the process of being assessed in Canada. Uh, it was supposed to have come out in June of this year. We're still waiting. Um, in EU, Thyram and Propaneb have been deregistered. Um, the Codex review is scheduled for 2022 and then there'll be some decisions made in 2023. Now, the APV may have indicated that they're waiting to see what the outcome of the codex review is. And the codex, the way the codex, is, oh, sorry, the codex system works, there's a group called the Joint Meeting of Pesticide Residue Experts, which consists of a group of toxicologists and a group of residue chemists. And they'll sit down and they'll assess the data and then they'll make some recommendations that the codex committee will consider and then act upon. And uh, I think the APV may is waiting to see what the, 
that those toxicologists and those residue chemists come back with. Um, the issues are fairly significant and part of the reason that some of these um, compounds are falling over in other jurisdictions is again because I think of primarily because of data gaps and changes in terms of the risk assessment methodologies. To do with the, the diethyl carbonates, what's occurring is we're seeing at the moment um, the, the residue definitions are changing. Um, in the past they've been dealt with by a, um, like a, a common moiety method, which is the carbon disulfide. All the diethyl carbonates, you could assess the, the levels of, of carbon disulfide in, a, say, a treated produce, and that would give you an indication of what had occurred, or at least the applications that had occurred. Um, that's now changing where the regulators are now moving to compound specific uh, residue definitions. So that they'll be able to differentiate between if Magazeb was applied, or Thyram was applied, or Propaneb was applied. So that we're having completely separate residue definitions. In addition to that, and then of course the question then comes, has the residue data that was originally generated 30 or 40 years ago, is it relevant? Chances are in the main, most of that data would have been based on the carbon disulfide approach. So in a lot of cases, we may well find that a lot of the uses that are currently registered in Australia, the data doesn't exist uh, to actually support those uses, if you like going forward when the APVMA decides to do its risk assessments. The other factor that sort of complicates issues is that uh, again, uh, there's a real in, an increasing co uh, focus on metabolites when it, coming, when it comes to this whole issue to do with these compounds. Historically, I think what tended to happen, the toxicologists would say, this is a very minor metabolite at very, very low levels, and we don't consider it to be toxicologically significant. Um, that doesn't really occur anymore, and to the point now where they're really focusing on some of these minor metabolites, and are there any sort of p potential for toxicological impacts? Uh, with the diethyl carbonates, at least for Mancazib in particular, and Metaram, there's a compound called ethylene thiourea that is produced uh, after the diethyl carbonates are, are, are applied. Um, more recently, it's now been decided that ethylene thiourea is actually toxicologically significant. Now, as, as a consequence of that, um, going back to the issue I mentioned before about dietary exposure, um, we have a, an ADI level, of, you know, an estimate of what people can be exposed to in a lifetime. We have a, an acute reference dose um, that they'll probably assess in terms of like, this is what a person can be exposed to in a 24 hour period. Um, now, in addition to that now, they'll be also saying, well, we want to know the levels of ethylene thiourea. So you're going to be looking at things like take Magazeb, so there could be the Magazeb, and then they'll want to know ethylene thiourea levels as well. And again, we're going to be in a situation where that's for the regulators to do their dietary exposure assessments. Um, is that data available? Um, in a lot of cases, I suspect not. And, and again, that's going to have an impact on, on the uses that in terms of um, what can be retained. It may well be that for a, in Australia, there may well be the, the data may well exist for some of the commodities and some of them, some of the major crops may well be supported by, by manufacturers. Uh, the issue is going to be for minor crops in particular. Uh, Mancazeb in particular are uh, used extensively in a whole range of crops. And I can see that when push comes to shove and the review kicks off, and uh, depending upon the outcomes of, of other countries, we may well find that a lot of, assuming that use can be retained or access can be retained, that a lot of the minor crops will be probably uh, lost, the use on those minor crops. And obviously that's gonna create a, a rather significant hole. In addition to that, there are concerns over the uh, occupational health and safety. Um, this that's what's been flagged in Canada and some environmental concerns as well. So there's a number of issues there to address those questions is gonna require data. Now the diethyl carbonates, I don't know how many, probably 40 years or more that they've been around. Um, so again, if the data exists, it's gonna be a matter of who has it and will they be prepared to actually provide it? I know in Europe, there was a diethyl carbonates task force formed um, to try and retain uses in Europe. Um, unfortunately, to date, they've been unsuccessful. But then Europe does have a very singular approach. Um, they take a hazard-based approach to risk assessment, or I shouldn't say risk assessment, to assessment, chemical assessment. So if a hazard is identified, that's it. If it breaches the hazard threshold, it's gone, irrespective of what risk mitigation measures could be implemented. Whereas in Australia and Canada and US and this sort of thing, it's, it's risk-based. So you could be in a situation where, yes, this is innately hazardous. This is a toxic compound, but we can manage it by the formulation, by uh, the way it's applied, a whole range of different issues there. And that can get it over the bar from the point of view of um, you know, environmental safety, oh &S, and consumer exposure and those sorts of issues. Um, so those are the, the questions as we go forward with um, 
with this. So this is going to be 2023, I think, will be a fairly a watershed period, I think, for the dithiocarbonates going forward. For the neonicotinoids, a more recent thing, uh, again, we're in a situation where they're heavily under scrutiny. Uh, they're currently under review by the APVMA. They're also being reviewed in New Zealand by the EPA there. Uh, in Canada, clethionidin had all its um, foliar uses uh, in orchards, strawberries and turf farms cancelled because uh, environmental concerns. EU, all outdoor uses are banned. It can only be used in uh, permanent greenhouse situations. Codex review is scheduled for 2022. That's the JMPR group. And in the USA, they recently went through and did risk mitigation, have increased the uh, risk mitigation measures. So they're actually capping or reducing the total amount that can be applied in a 12 month period. So we're seeing things occurring. Now, the issue to do with um, the pollinators, um, what surprised me, I suppose, was like in Canada, I think they were less concerned about pollinators, um, but I, and they then got very much concerned about in terms of off-target movement into other areas and this type of thing. So there's other issues there as well, potentially, um, going forward with the, the neonicotinoids. So that's going to be an, an interesting area uh, in terms of, you know, where this ends up in five years' time. The issues here, again, uh, we, we're down again to residue definitions. Um, one of the difficulties is that... Uh, a number of the neonicotinoids have uh, common metabolites, six, neo, six, neo, oh, sorry, six chloronicotinic acid. Um, it's found um, where acetamiprid is used, imidacloprid, um, and the new uh, fluprid if you're own from Bayer. Um, again, if this compound is determined to be toxicologically significant, it'll also then come into play in terms of um, health-based guidance values, the ADI, the acute reference dose, and then it'll be used for dietary exposure estimates. And then we get into a situation then, uh, and this is the, one of the concerns is then that they'll start looking at the entire group, the uses, because they've got a common metabolite. They can't just look at imidacloprid in, um, in isolation. They'll need to look at all the uses that acetamiprid, imidacloprid and fluproteferone have in common and does that and what levels of that metabolite occur in all the commodities that they're treated to and the levels of exposure and this type of thing. So it starts to ramp up, as you can see, in terms of the, the, uh, the issues uh, and in terms of the challenges in, from the point of view of maintaining access. The triazole fungicides have got a similar issue um, and, and that's another one that's, that's sort of on the horizon, but probably not that big a concern here. As I mentioned, there's concerns about pollinator protection and sur surface water contamination, which is the main issue I think that's, that's been flagged in Canada. So um, from the regular, so to try and assist industry uh, with these sorts of things, because there's a lot happening in this, in this area, um, as part of a Horde, industry, or, sorry, Horde Innovation funded project, we've been sort of working on developing what we call agrochemical regulatory risk assessments. And so what we're trying to do is basically just identify what's currently approved in the various hort crops. Um, to, and then just to provide some sort of background, I suppose, to what, to what issues are and, and a guide from the point of view of, of individual industries in terms of when they're assessing what their strategic needs might be in terms of going forward, um, that they appreciate the fact that there are these risks that while certain compounds may well be readily available, that's not necessarily the same, that'll be the case in five or 10 years time. And so basically to help with, with respect to the future, you know, pest management planning needs and this sort of thing and decision making. This is sort of what it looks like. This is the mango one where we've gone through. Um, we've, I've, we've tried to sort of rate things on the basis of short term, medium term, long term, um, and what the various compounds are. And this is just to give you an indication, I suppose, of how it looks. So obviously methitothione, we already know that it's on the way out. The label's gone um, and all useful will no longer be permitted after February next year. Um, fipronil is under review by the APVMA. It's scheduled for re-evaluation by that, through that codex system uh, in 2021 to 22. And in EU, there's no authorizations in place. So again, it's sort of from a long-term perspective, it's sort of, I suppose it's meant to flag that there are some issues out there that potentially could have an impact in terms of going forward from the industry perspective. Um, Clothianidin I've, I've touched on, okay, from Canada, Europe, this type of thing. Um, going down to, you know, from a fruit fly point of view, again, we've got dimethoates, another one, a metabolite issue has arisen there. It was reviewed by the, uh, the JMPR uh, in two, uh, 19, 2019. In 2020, the recommendation was that all the MRLs would be de deleted. Uh, because of COVID, the meeting didn't occur. So all those codex MRLs are still in place. 
Um, so I know I understand there is a manufacturer seeking to defend the compound. Um, how successful they'll be, I don't know. But um, there's another one potentially there that could be an issue going forward. Acetamiprid, as I mentioned, it's it's under review by the APVMA. Um, Maldicins, another malathion's another one. Uh, it's under review for chemistry, admittedly, but it's also down for reevaluation by Codex. And given the track record for the various organophosphate insecticides, I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if if we encounter some issues to do with metabolites going forward. So there's a right, and then there's trichlorophon, which is also it's gone from Europe. There's no Codex MRLs. It's gone from the United States. Australia is one of the last few countries using it, and I would be surprised if there's going to be a registrant with the data available to actually be able to um, defend it or support it when it eventually gets around to the APVMA looking at it. So from the point of view of fruit fly, you might sit there and go, well, yes, we've got a number of options available at the moment, but going forward um, in five years time, the cupboard might be rather bare. So that's the point of trying to provide this sort of information if you like to industries. Um, it's not all doom and gloom. I mean, well, I should say there is a level of doom and gloom. Part of it, I suppose that, so, what can Australia do about it? One of the difficulties we have uh, in terms of getting access to new chemistry is our market size. Um, and I did a bit of an assessment a few years back looking at the number of um, compounds, the new compounds that were registered in Australia and the US at the same time. Uh, and I came up within that four or five year period, there's about 26 new active ingredients that came into Australia and the US. Now, one of the issues there was that of those 26 compounds, there were 56 uses in crops in Australia compared to 149 in the United States. And that's a real reflection of the fact that obviously the bigger markets in the US and that's a bigger focus. The issue from an Australian point of view was that the companies will be coming in and registering in the major markets, which obviously makes sense from a commercial point of view. And then from the aspect of smaller industries, minor uses, this type of thing, then getting access, we're having to wait for the second or third tranche um, or pursuing these things through minor use permits. Uh, which is what Hort Innovation does um, fairly effectively. And, um, but it's a fairly, uh, I suppose, lengthy process to have to follow through. So the outcome, of course, is delayed access for smaller industries. Uh, and that's a, a real problem. And it's been an issue that um, I know is being lobbied with government for a number of years now to try and Im improve that, to actually provide incentives to registrants to actually bring more uses to Australia. Um, but to date, that's fallen on deaf ears. Um, in terms of what is coming, um, there's a number of hort innovation projects going at the moment. Um, some of these have been Commonwealth funded. There's a BASF fungicide, Fluxoperoxad and Pyroclostrobin, I'm not sure of the trade name, being developed for powdery mildew. There's the Bayer insecticide, um, DC163, that they're looking at for uh, various caterpillars and mango seed weevil. Uh, there's sulfoxiflor from Corteva for fruit spotting bug and scale insects. And then there's the Bayer insecticide flipper out of your own uh, for fruit spotting bug. I think there's also some work being done, um, or at least Hort Innovation is proposing to put in some grant applications. There's a new round of Commonwealth grants coming up, I think in the next month. And Hort Innovation is proposing to put in some grant applications for a bio fungicide. I think it's, um, it's called spiromesophen, and all, oh, sorry, miticide. And also a, a new insecticide coming from Syngenta. And I believe it's a new mode of action. So they're looking at a number of things there to try and gain access to some of these, some of these new chemistries. So the implications of some of this is as these MRLs go, I mentioned that Codex MRLs are referenced by a number of countries. I mean, Malaysia is an example where um, if there's no domestic MRL, um, then Malaysia will accept a Codex MRL. New Zealand accepts Codex MRLs. Uh, a number of countries will reference that sort of thing. So if the Codex MRLs disappear, that potentially creates problems going forward in a number of markets. I mean, recently China has been um, updating a lot of their MRLs and a large part of what they've been doing is just incorporating Codex MRLs holus bolus into their system. If those Codex MRLs disappear, you basically lose a significant way of getting access to, um, or potentially losing access to a number of markets. The Middle East is another place where they will refer, uh, middle, you know, uh, the Arab Emirates, this sort of thing, will reference Codex MRLs um, in the absence of a domestic one. So as I mentioned, the lack of MRLs or there, and, and then there are MRL differences as well, because we have situations where for some commodities, um, we've got fairly unique pests compared to another market and our MRL might be different, could be higher, could be lower, and that can be an issue. The reference I mentioned, um, Singapore and Thailand are two other countries that have referenced Codex MRLs. Um, or they'll refer to other jurisdictions. Egypt and Saudi Arabia will look to the EU. Um, they'll also look at the US, USA, Chile and Mexico 
also referenced the USA emeralds, more of a, a reflection of the, their, their major export markets. Unfortunately, there's no single globally accepted approach. There's been a number of um, activities trying to, I suppose, get consensus on this. Um, to date, we haven't really got very far in terms of getting there. Uh, there was a APEC project at Fazans um, that was, was running and it was sponsored by the Australian government trying to develop some guidelines, at least for the APEC economies. Um, and there was a document produced on that, uh, providing guidelines for countries to use and this type of thing. I don't know that there's been much uptake of that, uh, even though there was some, a fair degree of participation from various countries. Um, so as I mentioned, they've got different data requirements. From an industry perspective, um, you can try and go and, um, you know, I've heard people talk about, well, okay, can we get import MROs established? Well, in theory, yes, that's a possibility. Um, assuming that you've actually got access to the data uh, to submit um, and they've got different data requirements. As I said, there's the cost of the data generation if it doesn't exist, uh, preparing the submission and then the cost of application. Also, the USA at the moment for one MRL is about 60,000 US to get a, uh, an MRL established. So to try and get say multiple MRLs established in the US, assuming you've got the data available, um, is going to be a pretty significant outcome. In Korea, it's a lot less. I think it's about ten to fifteen thousand dollars per MRL, or uh, equivalent to Australian dollars per MRL. Um, so again, you've got significant costs to start doing that. So it's really important, I suppose, where if there are export markets that people are looking at or wanting to get into or develop, uh, there needs to be engagement with the registrants. You need registrant support to ensure that the MRLs, if you like, that if you're going to be targeting a market, is the company going to be going to that market with that compound? And are you likely to be getting MRLs established that are going to be relevant? So in conclusion, I suppose, um, what I'm trying to say is the challenges are significant. Um, industries need to be strategic in terms of their thinking, in terms of their planning. Uh, I know the, the amount of money available for R&D is limited, um, but again, it needs to be on the basis of the key uh, uses and needs that um, you know, going forward. And as I mentioned, engagement with registrants is, is going to be critical. Um, and also with the regulator. Uh, to get a clear understanding of, of what's going on. And I think that's important as well, so that you're not, uh, I suppose, being blindsided when the, the APV may, for argument's sake, suddenly decides it's doing something. Uh, I know when the um, uh, Fenthine review was going through, there's a lot of people sort of saying that they'd, they'd never heard about it, but that the issue was that had been brewing since about 1998. Um, and it was just one of those sorts of issues where the level of engagement, I think, by some sectors of different industries had been fairly limited. And so it's important that people engage with the regular and with the registrants to get a clear understanding of what the pathway going forward is from the point of view of chemical access. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, do we have any questions from the floor? You can unmute yourself or use the chat function. Kevin, is that report, that risk, uh, regulatory risk assessment report, um, able to be shared? Uh, it's, I've, it's, I think I've shared it with you. It's just been updated. Um, mm -hmm. The updated ones, as they're updated, they're posted on the um, Hort Innovation website. Okay, so, we'll, so they can be downloaded we'll, from there. Yep, we'll put a link um, in the follow up email so you can have access to that report. So I don't think we have any questions. Thanks, Kevin. So I'll um, now hand over to um, Kate Daly. Um, Kate is the North Queensland um, Account Manager uh, with Corteva. And she'll be um, giving us an update on some of the mango related products that um, Corteva is, has developed. Kate, can you share your screen? Yep, I can. Uh, can you just bear with me? Perfect. Excellent. Okay, can you see that okay? We can, yes, thanks Kate. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Maureen, and uh, thanks to the Australian Manga Industry Association for allowing us to uh, 
to present. Um, to speak and engage with you guys today. Um, as Maureen said, my name is Kate Bailey. I'm the Territory Account Manager for North Queensland for Corteva, and I'm based in Townsville. Um, I look after basically from Mossman down to Serena, um, so a couple of uh, mango hubs in, in my area. Um, my contact details, uh, which Maureen is going to share the presentation with you, are there. So if there's uh, something that anybody wants to contact uh, me for afterwards, please feel free. I uh, just wanted to start off and uh, give you an idea of the product range overview we have for mangoes. So um, the products we have are ideally suited for IPM programs at this stage anyway. And so in the green is Verdict, which is a grass selective herbicide. Orange is Transform. Uh, sorry, your insecticides, which is Transform, Success, Applaud, Entrust, which is the, the original formulation uh, of Success, Venosid, which has just, just come out, uh, and Naturalua. And in the purple is both diathane and Cocide for the fungicides. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is Transform and uh, Naturalua. So transform uh, isoclass active insecticide uh, for targeted control of fruit spotting bug and banana spotting bug. Uh, there's currently an industry permit in place held by Horde Innovation Australia that's current until the 30th of April in 2023. So as well as mangoes, the permit is held for lychee, papaya and passion fruit, field ground props. Uh, for fruit spotting bug and banana spotting bug. The rate in those crops is 40 mils per 100 litres on the permit. This is just a snapshot of the permit. Uh, so I will send out a copy of the entire permit uh, with the presentation for Marine to send, send to you guys. Uh, and I would encourage you to have a look at the, the restrictions and the further information on that label as well. But briefly, uh, no more than two applications with minimum 14 days in between the sprays. And then the sprays applied with a calibrated rig basically as a foliar to the point of runoff. Now uh, you don't have to use an adjuvant with it, um, but it might, might improve the, uh, the control. Um, also with the, when we're talking about point of runoff, um, I guess the critical um, amount of active to get get in per hectare is 400 mils. On your permit, um, the only way that you can do that is to apply the 1,000 litres uh, of water per hectare. My understanding is and experience anecdotally with growers is they tend to like to go under in some cases depending on their um, ability for coverage. But I would highly encourage um, good thorough coverage, but that 1,000 litres per hectare to get to the 400 mils uh, per hectare. The withholding period for the transforming mangoes is seven days. And uh, growers have told me that that works especially well when the crops, when the, the heat um, increases, pest pressure increases, and uh, other chemicals which they may, may otherwise use in rotation don't fit in with that withholding period. So it's a a really nice little niche to have that seven day withholding period there with that as well. So what is Transform? It's a novel mode of action. It's a group 4C. Um, so stress that it is not a neonicotoid, which is a, a group 4A. Uh, it has excellent contact, systemic and translaminar activity. So it's the, the systemic, it's not moving throughout the plant, it's upward and outward. Um, it has fast acting, um, extended residual control, and it's active on a broad range of sap feeding pests. Uh, it has a really excellent fit in IPM programs as well. Uh, this data is actually, uh, was pulled from uh, trials that we did in avocados, but relevant to the banana and uh, fruit spotting bug. So you can see on your left hand side is the percentage of damaged fruit. Um, untreated was uh, almost 30% and you see transform at the permitted rate 40 mils per 100 litres uh, was you know less than 5% so um, very close to standard control with bulldog 
Um, you can see the lower rates at 20 mil and 30 mil were not um, as effective. And then towards the end this year, commercial regime versus endo, which is no longer registered. The numbers above um, on the graph there, 25, 25, 44, is the sample plot size. So you can see at 44 sample plot size, there's certainly um, good results uh, that came back in all those for the transform. So very good in controlling both the fruit spotting and banana spotting bug. I guess to drive home the, the key points, um, adequate, adequate spray coverage to the point of runoff is critical. Um, avoiding concentrate applications, concentrate applications for fruit spotting bug and banana spotting bug is actually off label. Um, as I said, I would really get good coverage is important, about that thousand litres a hectare to get to your 400 mils per hectare has been really uh, effective in controlling pests where I've been out with growers. Um, had some really, really good results, um, but at that 400 mils per hectare, a thousand litres plus per hectare. Um, don't have your other chemistry, they spray when your bees are actively foraging. Um, the, once the spray deposits are dry, transforms very safe chemical for bees to go back in and forage. This is, um, so the, the permit that we have is strictly for fruit spotting and banana spotting bugs, but I just wanted to share with you some information that we have in regard to scale, um, and I guess for myself, anecdotally for mealy bug. So Transform is actually registered in other crops for sap feeding uh, pests. And from what I've seen myself and from uh, feedback from growers, there's also really good efficacy on both mango scale uh, and pink, pink wax scale with Transform. So this, uh, research was conducted in Queensland, um, high volume applications, so 1,000 litres plus. There was two applications um, and the data that we have is 28 days after application. So you can see, um, again, transform at the 40 mil per 100 litres for mango scale. Um, very effective on both male and female. Um, significantly better obviously than the untreated but also compared to standard uh, applications as well and then applaud which is another one of our insecticides was very good on mango scale if you move over to the pink wax scale again transform very very good on the pink wax scale um, applaud less than effective i guess worth noting that pink wax scale isn't isn't on the applaud uh, label but um and yeah, we don't have data there, but as I said, anecdotally, um, growers are also coming back and saying that uh, they're getting very good results with uh, mealy bug as well. So again, towards the end of um, your season, when you're getting close to your harvest, um, you tend to get flare ups in the heat. And uh, yeah, anecdotally, the guys are controlling their fruit spotting or applying uh, transform to control fruit spotting and banana spotting bug and then also getting some really good results on scale and mealybug as well. So just thought that was worth uh, mentioning. The other uh, product that I wanted to talk to you about today is Naturalure, which is a, a fruit fly bait that we have. So um, basically there's two types of, of baits that you can use, um, a protein bait and a pheromone bait. So pheromone baits are, um, are used to attract um, male flies, so male, on, male annihilation trapping, and your protein baits attract your male and female flies um, across a number of species. So then they're trapped, and then normally there's a toxicant, um, which they, they feed on and ingest. So uh, pretty pretty funny looking mangoes there, I appreciate. I'm sorry I don't have a picture of mangoes in there, but um, what is natural? Natural is a protein base. Um, so it's based on spinosad, which is um, the original formulation of success. Um, you don't need to mix the insecticide. It's highly effective. It's uh, organically certified. 
and um, very selective to key beneficial insects. So it's highly suitable for use in your IPM systems. Um, it's different in that it's uh, got humectants in it, which absorbs moisture from the atmosphere, and it keeps the bait um, attractive, very sticky, and uh, attractive to the fruit fly for longer. So basically just dilute it with water um, and then put it out, which means it's very, very end user safe as well. Um, it's active for about 10 days after application, but generally we'll say to um, apply seven days, every seven days. It's got really good storage, so it doesn't degrade. Um, it's very consistent control, as I said, organic certification. Um, the big thing that we um, hear back, or I suppose feedback-wise from end users, is that it's very safe product. There's no mixing, um, and it's yeah very low risk to users. So the orchard workers and um, owners really appreciate that, and it's soft on your beneficials as well. Uh, so registered for control of all fruit fly species in Australia, so your Queensland fruit fly, the Mediterranean fruit fly, cucumber, Jarvis's, and lesser Queensland fruit fly. Um, I don't want to go through this too much. As I said, it will get sent out. Um, but there's yeah, the information, it's very, very similar to um, other bait sprays that you, you know, you would spray out. Um, as I said, there's probably no need to go through that, but obviously if anybody would like any more information in particular, um, I'm happy to send that through or, um, or speak about that specifically. So feel free to contact me with that. Um, so just in regard to um, protein baits uh, in the orchard, um, the way that the fruit flies tend to shelter is in, within the trees and towards the tops of the canopies. So bait should be applied to trees at a height of 1.5 to 2 metres. Um, they tend to be most effective when applied to foliage of the crops or surrounding vegetation. Um, obviously to lessen the, the risk of fruit damage, um, apply the bait to alternate rows each week. Um, we do recommend weekly baiting um, four weeks prior to harvest. That's about, um, that's really just touching base on two um, very significant products in the portfolio, two very um, effective and significant products in the portfolio. Uh, I'm not too sure how many people uh, were aware of the permit, but uh, as I said, that will be sent out and I'm absolutely happy to speak to any growers directly um, about that. The other thing that I wanted to mention was uh, we do have a product finder. It's a digital product guide. And you can um, have this so that it's on your phone or on your tablet. And you can go through, uh, you can see what products, as I demonstrated in the first slide, um, are registered specifically in your crop. Um, and also send labels and MSDSs straight from your tablet or phone. So I actually use it myself and it's a really handy guide. Um, if anybody wants me to send that, I can. But yeah, just follow the... Uh, the address there and, and that's uh, available. So yeah, look, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to everybody today. And uh, as I said, feel free to contact me if I can help in any way. Thank you very much, Kate. Uh, we have a question in the chat room uh, from Marcello, who's a mango grower in Mariba. Um, it's regarding transform and the timing of um, application. So you said uh, it's two applications a year. Um, he's saying that for avocado, uh, for avocados, it's usually um, applied uh, between flowering and fruit set. Um, what what is the, the ideal timing for mangoes? Uh, yep, great question. Um, I guess the where the growers that I've um, spoken to who've been using Transform find it of most use. Obviously, um, flowering where in, in an avocado orchard where you have consistent fruit set and that longevity is really important. So 
So they, they like using it and maintaining beneficials in avocado for that extended fruit set where guys in mangoes have really seen the benefit is actually towards the end of the program because of the short withholding period. So where your um, alternate products or, uh, you know, three to four weeks withholding period, they're generally using the transform towards the end of the program to protect for the fruit spotting and banana spotting bug. And then I said also, you know, getting getting the added benefit of scale and mealy bug control in, in most instances as well. Um, yeah, not to say that it wouldn't be effective at the start of the program, but really in avocados is where you've got that extended fruit set um, while flowering, which is why, why it's generally positioned early and then also to extend um, the beneficials or to maintain beneficials as well. Thanks, Kate. Um, uh, happy to, to, to contact me directly if you wanted to speak more about the timing. Yeah, Marcello, does that answer your question? Um, obviously, I will share Kate's contact details with, um, with everyone. Um, we have another question here from um, Robert Gray. Um, are there any bait products for use on pests other than fruit flies? Uh, in in our range, sorry. Oh uh, well, I think in all range. Or if you're if you're um, aware of any other product out there, I think uh, there's certainly lure and trap, um, mm. but I couldn't couldn't comment specifically. I think um, there's a range of uh, in the past we've used um, heliosis lures, uh, leaf miner lures in different crops. I believe there's um, full armyworm, uh, like trap, traps and lures as well, but I couldn't specifically comment on, I'm sorry, but uh, yeah, certainly for, for bait, uh, that's the only one that Corteva has. Um, yeah, I'm not too sure, I apologise. No, that's all right. Thanks, Kate. Um, so are there any other questions from the floor for Kate? Yeah, Maureen, there's one in the chat from Robert. Um, yes, that's the one we just oh, yep. mentioned. I think there's been... Yep, no, no other questions. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, I just wanted to um, remind everyone that if there is any, um, I guess, update on new label registration, uh, new minor use permit or um, extension of minor use permit. All of those updates um, will be published in our e-newsletter weekly. Um, so if you're not, if you don't receive our newsletter, I highly encourage you to do so. Um, please feel free to contact me and I can, um, uh, I can make sure you receive our, our newsletter. Um, so thank you very much, Kate. I will now hand over to um, Morgan Lewis and Martin Shaw from Stoller. So Morgan, will you be able to share yes, thank you very much. screen with us? We'll start sharing our screen. You know, we're there, can we say that one? Yes. Perfect. With the slideshow. Here we go. Excellent. Thanks, Morgan. No problems. So, good afternoon, all. Um, yeah, thanks for joining us today. I and mean, then, thank you to uh, Australian Mango for giving us the opportunity to speak with you all. Um, I'm Morgan Lewis. I'm the Area Sales Manager for Farnham of Queensland, I'm based in Cairns. And beside me is Martin Shaw, our Senior Agronomist, I'm also based in the far north here. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, today we'll be touching base on three points. Um, firstly, it'll be a brief uh, background of who we are. Uh, secondly, it'll be a new product called Biohold um, that we're currently on a soft launch base. And Martin will briefly touch on our Mango SIS, um, otherwise known as our Stolate Integrated Solution, um, which are designed to address their key growing issues. Um, so, for those who don't know, um, we're a global nutrition supplier. 
manufacturing high quality fertilizers and specialty nutrient products. Um, this year, um, we are celebrating 25 years in Australia, but then 50 years globally. And fortunately for um, COVID-19, it's put holds on our celebrations, but hopefully next year we'll um, be able to celebrate in style. Um, and we're about a thousand people uh, worldwide for our employees. Um, Jerry Stoller, I founded a company 50 years ago. His aim was to do something special by helping farmers to improve growing their crops. Um, to this day, we're still very growth focused. We take pride in understanding the challenges that farmers face and then find solutions to fix these challenges. Um, moving on to our new product called Biohold. Um, it's very new and exciting. Um, it's a patented liquid fertilizer um, with macro and micronutrients. Um, it's been formulated to aid in abiotic stress management uh, throughout the flowering in early fruit size and stages. Um, the abiotic stresses can result in a weak flowering and poor fruit set. Uh, as mentioned, it's a patent formula with macro and micronutrients. Uh, they follow the application after a juicy ethylene during flowering and the early fruit, fruit set. Um, there are several effects that biohealth can have on the fruit. Uh, they include um, supporting carbohydrate movement on the developing fruit, increasing late flower strength, uh, increasing fruit size and improved weight, and then supporting fruit retention and nutrition. Um, so, ethylene is a naturally occurring plant hormone. Um, however, when a plant is under stress, ethylene can rise to unhealthy levels. Um, which uh, leads to cell death. Um, within cells, you'll find the mitochondria, um, which these are known as the powerhouses for creating the energy um, for the plant. Um, when, when ethylene enters the cell, it will prevent the, rep the respiration, um, and the mitochondria um, are able to perform their roles. Um, when bioholders is applied, it will prevent the ethylene from remaining within the cell, um, and therefore the cell and the mitochondria can continue to respire and then create the energy for the plant. Um, so, biohold will strengthen the flowers, and in particular, it will strengthen the stigma receptability um, and improve the longevity of the ovule. Um, early, early flowers are generally stronger than the later flowers, and this is due to the ethylene buildup over that flowering um, period. Um, when bioholders is applied early, um, it will slow the ethylene buildup, uh, and then this will later them protect the later flowers. Um, the late bihold applications uh, promotes fertilization and then cell division, uh, which means you're holding more fruit, helping the fruit in size. Um, and this trial here was conducted in Bowen back in 2018. Um, by an independent researcher. Um, there are further trials in progress this year um, based uh, from Bowen to Mariba and Machuba and the Bula area. Um, since this trial, we've adjusted the timings in the products. Um, we found it's better um, to split the rate into more applications to cover the fair and period. Um, Martin will explain shortly on our SIS I mean, in more detail. Um, but basically the recommendation is a three to 600 mils, two to three times over the flaring period at a maximum of 1.2 litres a hectare. Um, this is just some basic results that we saw on this, uh, on this trial. Um, so the main number of fruit per tree has been increased in all fragments compared to the control, um, between 5.2 and 18.9% increase. Um, the mean fruit weight um, had also shown an increase, um, but they weren't significantly different of course, um, compared to control. Um, more importantly, you can see here, uh, there was no reduction in, um, in size from any of the treatments and the size of the fruit. Um, and um, as you would expect with an increased fruit numbers on the tree, um, you'll obviously have to see a more remarkable, remarkable yield. Um, and this can be seen in this graph here. Um, 
And that was our buy hold presentation. And now I'll pass it on to Martin for our sort of solutions. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so this is our Stoller Integrated Solution, or SIS. These are designed to assist growers and industry with specific growing issues and timings. Uh, this is only a guide, so if you're interested, please contact your local Stoller territory manager or distributor. The SIS starts shortly after the last crop has been harvested. Uh, we recommend leaf and soil tests immediately after the previous crop. Uh, to establish nutrient requirements for the next crop. Uh, this our program incorporates calcium as a key nutrient. Um, calcium deficiencies can lead to all sorts of industry issues, such as fruit quality, transport and shelf life issues. Um, we use products such as Set Enhance uh, with Biohold, which assist in pollination, fruit set and fruit sizing. Uh, this is due to the relationship of calcium and boron and cobalt during pollination. Uh, if possible, leaf tests, I would recommend leaf tests on a monthly basis through the growing period. So you can be um, proactive in adjusting your nutrient issues uh, well before flower ends. Um, yep. And that's really about all I can I've got to say on that. Um, thank you very much for inviting us. Um, and if uh, anybody wants to talk to us further on this new product, we have a lot of trials on Barhold happening uh, at the moment, and we will have results um, which we can publish later on in the year. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Morgan and Martin. Um, are there any questions from the floor? No. You can use the chat function if you'd like. It, it's Martin here again. Can I just say that via hold, um, we're working with avocados as well. So it will have a place for avocado crops. We have a lot of uh, trials on avocados this year, as well as mangoes. Thank okay. You, Martin. Well, um, if there's no, um, no question, um, I think we'll um, wrap up now. Uh, I just want to um, thanks every, thank everyone again for attending today um, and a special thank you to um, our presenters. Uh, I want to remind you that uh, next week will be our last webinar of our um, weekly pre-season webinar series. Uh, it'll be on Wednesday, the 7th of October at 12 p.m. and you'll get an update uh, on export. Um, so thanks everyone again. Um, and uh, you'll receive an email from me this afternoon with the slides from today and the recording will be made available um, next week and circulated uh, in our newsletter on Tuesday. I wish everyone uh, a good afternoon. Um, and I hope to see you next week. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Thank you very much.